Well, getting back to Galatians 3 again. The book of Galatians should be read in a way with the book of Romans because the book of Galatians shows us we're not justified by the works of the law. The book of Romans shows we're not justified by the works of the law. Tie the two books together if you want to have real deep studies. That might take you a year. <laughs> it takes a long time. Praise God. All that time we're getting fed. And it says in, in verse 10, uh, those who rely on the works of the, of the law are under a curse. Okay, these charismatics who say that uh, they're not under the curse, but they, they've got the prosperity. Okay, they're only on the... They're, they're not under the law as works. They're under the law as tithes. They're under the law as a misconception, but they're not under the law as works. Everybody who follows the law of Moses is under the law. They're under the curse. Everybody. Because it says no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous shall live by faith. And the fact of righteousness by faith is underscored in the history of Abraham. In Romans chapter 4, there's somewhat of the history of Abraham. And here it shows very clearly our righteousness is justification. Chapter 4 is much about Abraham. And it says, Was Abraham justified according to the flesh? The flesh is Hagar, of course, for us. For us, the flesh is the law. For us, the flesh is anything to do in our worship or our beliefs or our service to God. Anything to do with this world because it says in Hebrews chapter 10 chapter 9 I think this verse 1 they served under the old tabernacle that was of a carnal or worldly situation it was carnal their service was carnal and worldly and earthly it's not acceptable and I read this little bit or the uh, yeah, from somebody who's not a Pentecostal. Maybe it was John Owens, somebody, one great spiritual giant and scholar who said, if to any degree in our worship of God we go back to anything of the Old Testament of the law, if we go back in that area, we've gone back to nothing. It doesn't exist before God. Nothing of the law exists before God. Nothing we do of the law exists before God. Now the basis of the law exists before God. The law is good. It exists before God, but it's performed in our lives because God said, I will write my laws on their heart. It's not something we have to work at and we do. He has written it in our hearts, but that would only be to the extent we read what's in his word. But on top of that, the, we live according to the spirit and the spirit works it out in our lives. So we are not following the law. Their worship was under the law. When they brought the sacrifices, that was worship. The whole scene was one of worship. The approach to God was one of worship to God. That's what it was classed as. The whole scene of David was worship to God. It was law, based on law. It is not of law any longer the law of faith it makes us think a lot doesn't it in relation to our Christian services and that's one thing that a lot of the old Presbyterians and Methodists and uh, even Baptists said when they declared we will not have musical instruments they said you're doing a work of the flesh a work of law it's what uh, David did. You're doing a work of the flesh. The heathen do it. The heathen have their musical instruments. The heathen have their dancing. I think they got a point. But of course nobody in the world would believe me today. But 
I think they have a major point. Now, that doesn't mean to say I would throw out all musical instruments and all music. Don't misunderstand me. But to come before God and think that our, that our playing of a musical instrument is the means of worship to God is wrong. We use it to facilitate our worship, but it's not the means of worship, and that's where everybody's making the mistake. And often in, an, in meetings overseas, I've never had cause to do it here, I will say to those who want the, to be baptized in the Spirit, or if we get into the Spirit, no music. And sometimes you've got the musicians there, and I have to nicely say, you know, because they just get there. And I say, you know, we're not having music. Yeah, one of the old timers used to say, uh, our tongues are our musical instrument. Isn't that lovely? See, God, is, God doesn't want to listen to the music we play, but he does want to listen to our tongues. Because it says, it's acceptable to God when we praise and thank him with our lips. This is a sacrifice, it says in Hebrews, that is much pleasing to God. That's the sacrifice of praise that he wants. Now, of course, you're never going to turn the whole church from music. But anyway, I go, we, let's go our own way uh, as we see fit. Uh, but okay, let's get the picture. Now, coming back to Romans 4, it says the base of pleasing God is, verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. God said, because you believe, you've got righteousness. You are justified before me. Because it says uh, in verse 9, we say that faith was counted or reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. In other words, he was reckoned to be righteous. Right? He was considered righteous. Now, in all those people, they would have had a measure of the Spirit of God that we get in the new birth or a measure of Christ that we get in the new birth, a measure. There must have been something there that was from the righteousness of God so that their lives were ordered in a righteous and holy manner. We have it in, the, in being born again. There's something given to us that enables us to live a righteous life if we fill our hearts with the Word of God because the Bible, Jesus said, now you are clean through the Word that I have spoken to you. The Word of God cleans us and it's as the Holy Spirit does his work in our spirit. And, you know, there's, there's too much of the idea of the flesh even when it comes to sanctification. Now, sanctification is a major subject in the Bible but I think most of the churches really, I, I, I think we've had it wrong. And I followed them a lot, up to a degree. It definitely is not a second work of blessing. No way. Which uh, the holiness people thought and the Nazarenes thought, I think, and even the Methodists thought there was a second blessing. It's not a second blessing. It's not a second experience. It's in the experience of salvation where we're redeemed, we're justified, we're sanctified. But in the experience of salvation, we're born again. We're born of the Word, the water, and we're born of the Spirit. Jesus said that in, in John 3. So there's a seed in us, a holy seed of God, that works in our spirits. It does not change our... Uh, how can I put this? <clears throat> It is, not, it is not to change us from following an unholy life to following a holy life because it cannot change our soul. Our spirit's changed. We're given a, a principle of divine righteous life in us, the Holy Seed, so that the Word of God and the Spirit of God can work in us so that that comes through because we put it on by faith and we put off the old man that can never be changed. Now, this same preacher that I often quote because he was my pastor for a few years, he was a godly 
Presbyterian, ex-Presbyterian, a very Pentecostal one. He took Smith Wigglesworth around New Zealand. <clears throat> well, anyway, he used, we used to sing. Uh, there was a chorus that used to tell us uh, we could be better or something, and he used to say straight out, you can't, you can't be in your soul. There, there's, there's a renewal in your spirit. Now, your actions can be better. Your life can be better. But you yourself and your soul can never be improved. Now, can it? It's always lurking there. What can be improved is your behavior because they are letting your behavior come from your, the spiritual life of Christ within and not from the, from the soulish life, not from the carnal life. Uh, uh, even getting into the soulish life is beginning to delve into the carnal. By that I mean in worship. It's a major thing that the Pentecostals have gone from the spirit to the soul in their singing and in their worship. And so what's emphasized? The soul. Now Mary said, uh, my soul doth magnify the Lord. She was still under the Old Testament. That's what David did. But then she said, my spirit does rejoice in God my Saviour. She did not say, my soul magnifies God my Saviour. She said, my spirit rejoices in God my uh, Saviour. Now, she would have been speaking by the Holy Ghost. She didn't know those things of herself. There was a Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit prof uh, of prophecy that came, a prophetic word that came upon her. And prophecy is not always foretelling the future. Everybody makes a mistake about that. Foretelling... A prophesying is glorifying God. Prophesying is talking about the things of salvation many times. Prophesying occasionally, very occasionally, very occasionally tells the future. Prophecy very occasionally lets us know what kind of a ministry we're going to have. Very occasionally. Now you hear it a lot, but it's not the Spirit of God speaking. And I say that because I've heard what has been said to people. I know what was said to... Peter, and uh, I know what's, what was said to Lester. We were in a meeting in India, and now Lester just came along with me, you know. And though we, try, we used to have him laying hands on the sick in those days, but he just came along with me, you know. He wasn't called, he wasn't a... But I tried to encourage him. But this person, who was a pastor, he got into this wonderful prophesying, and he prophesied great things of Lester and he said he was going to be connected with Singapore and he was going to find money. No way was that a prophecy. And the same things happen around Australia all the time. See, it's like wanting to go to the fortune teller. And that's, and that's forbidden. The whole realm of prophecy in Australia and New Zealand is out, especially in Australia. And, you know, it's far better not to have it if it's going to be out. But I firmly believe in prophecy. I've done it myself. I've prophesied over people. Now, they said it was right, but I didn't prophesy any amazing things. You know what I mean? Like everybody does around here. They prophesy somebody, oh, you're an apostle. You know where they get that from? The latter rain move. Because when the latter rain move happened in, in uh, Canada, when they got to Saskatchewan, wasn't it? Saskatchewan, Peter? Yeah? Saskatchewan. When they were banned and they fled to Saskatchewan, then they got into the into somebody prophesying. God would say, "I want so and so to be so and so. I want so and so to be so and so." So it just comes from the latter rain move, which is greatly false. The teaching is false, and the experiences are false. Now, I would not like to say that those people are under satanic power at all. Yeah, they're delving, starting to delve into it. They were in it in the, in the laughing move, without a doubt. The laughing move was full of demonic manifestations worldwide. In fact, I would say 90 to 95% were demonic. And I think I'm right. We've seen the videos, DVDs. We've been to meetings and heard the stories. But they're following the flesh, Right? See, it's easy to, flow, uh, well, it's easy if you don't follow the Word of God. It's not easy to follow the flesh, really. Because, like, if you want to give a word of prophecy or a tongue's interpretation, you know, it's different 
and, and you're not way out. And, and if you're in, in interpretation and prophecy generally, there's a large base of being on the scriptures. Because we're not supposed to present new revelations that are outside of the scriptures, are we? Because it says we're not to add and we're not to take away. So in Romans chapter 4, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness. The seal was a seal of the righteousness. Now there is a seal in the New Testament experience of the Christian. It's not circumcision because we're not of the flesh. Abraham was walking in the flesh. It was his flesh. He was circumcised in the flesh. We're not circumcised in the flesh. We're, we're, not, we're circumcised on the death of Christ by the Spirit in the heart. He had the righteousness by faith. And so to seal it, God says, you are circumcised. Now we get the righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. We are not circumcised We were circumcised then. on the cross because it's to do with the flesh. See, circumcision is the flesh is cut. And on the cross... The nature of fleshly sin was cut in the, by, because Jesus Christ's flesh was torn and cut and he died. That's how we come to be circumcised with him. His flesh was torn instead of our flesh or Abraham's flesh being torn by circumcision. So his flesh being torn meant that there was something that came and dealt with the, our sin in his flesh and cut the power of it away. So when we believe in Christ, we have a circumcision of the heart and our carnal nature is dealt with, its power is taken away. Most Christians never fully follow their carnal nature. If they follow their carnal nature enough and quit having faith in Christ and following him, they'll go to hell. The Bible does not say that you cannot be cut off. It says so a few times in the New Testament. There's no such thing as one saved, always saved. In fact, you know, when you see what's going on in the church, you just wonder how many are really born again and how many are going to have. Uh, personally, I could never judge them. You know, we can't. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the judge. But we have a seal. It's a seal of our righteousness before God to such an extent that our righteousness produces us eternal life in heaven. The righteousness of Abraham produced a faith of the eternal life in heaven that he could see afar that he would experience one day. Our vision is closer. It says in Hebrews 11, uh, by faith... Abra and all of them, they saw, they were looking for the city whose builder and maker is God. That was his vision. That's where his faith knew his righteousness would end. So he had the seal that God accepted his righteousness that looked to a heaven that would be revealed to him in the future by giving him the seal of circumcision. He was going to inherit heaven. We get the seal. But our seal is not circumcision. We are circumcised on the cross and it is not the flesh, our flesh. But we get a seal. Our seal is, is the Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And I'll spell it out. It's not the Holy Spirit just as some vague experience or the Holy Spirit coming in. It's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's the promised Holy Spirit. Every time you read about the promise of the Holy Spirit, it's in connection with speaking in tongues. Uh, every time you, you, you read a verse about receiving the Holy Spirit, it's not about some experience later than salvation that is, that is involved in salvation. It is about some experience after salvation. Uh, Acts chapter 
Acts chapter no, uh, 20, is it, or 21, where Paul went to Ephesus. He found six men who, who, who believed. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So you don't receive the Holy Spirit when you believe. That he's talking about. In fact, I am beginning to think that it's not the actual person, per se, of the Holy Spirit coming to salvation at all. It's the Spirit of Christ. Because it says in Romans 8, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ. It doesn't say if you don't have the Holy Spirit. There is a distinction. Hebrews 9, 12, who by the eternal Spirit offered himself out without spot, without spot to God. His own eternal Spirit. He is the eternal Spirit. And so we receive of that Spirit of His. But at the same time, there is the operation of the Holy Spirit because we're born of the Spirit. But even then, it doesn't say we're born of the Holy Spirit. It just says we're born of the Spirit. Yeah, well, anyway, the Holy Spirit is seated in the Spirit of Jesus Christ. There's some combination and connection because Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. Without measure. That means the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I mean, these things are beyond, beyond our natural understanding. We just have to accept what they say. And, if, and maybe it might pay for you, for you to ask Peter to do a DVD on this. Would you like a DVD on this? Yeah, uh, Ephesians 1, chapter 13 says, and we, we know this, they heard the word of truth, one, the gospel. Two, then they believed. Then the third step, they were sealed. So when the apostle Paul said to those men, did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? He's talking about the same thing as he's talking about in Ephesians 1. He's the same person. The person who said that wrote Ephesians 1. And so, you know the story. He then laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost because they heard them speaking in tongues and prophesying. We are sealed with the Holy Ghost. We are not sealed with circumcision. Abraham was the type. We have a far better exp uh, experience than Ab Abraham ha had in relation to a personal salvation and so forth. Uh, so then in Romans chapter 4, it says, as we go on, verse 16, it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on, on grace. What's the promise all about? See, it says in, in Galatians, it says that you might receive the promise of the Spirit. It's not talking about the promise of salvation. Uh, it says, I think it's uh, Galatians 3.16, uh, or at the end, that you might receive the uh, promise of the Spirit by faith. Uh, Galatians 3.14. Uh, uh, yeah, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. What's the blessing? So that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The promised Spirit. Not that we might receive Christ. I don't think there's any t uh, phrase in the New Testament that says, do you want to receive Christ? I don't think so. It's always believe on Christ. We always say, do you want to receive Christ? Mm. Well, I'm not sure that we can receive him. We believe in him. We're given faith. We're not given anything to receive. Like if you go to Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. By faith are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves. Not through believing, not through receiving. It's through faith. We all say the wrong things. But amazingly, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They call upon the name of the Lord, whatever we've said. <laughs> Yeah, but it's nice to get things a bit right, I think. And so the promise is the Holy Spirit. Now, that's somewhat amazing because the cross of Jesus Christ is all about our sin and salvation. And redemption is all about our sin and salvation. Yet the promise of the Father 
is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 uh, that you might receive the promise of the Father. It's the promise of the Father and he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost who is the Holy Spirit come to us uh, in a baptism whereby we speak in tongues. That's what this, the, the promise is all about. There is a greater emphasis on that promise than any of us in the church have really considered. Now, I'm not underplaying salvation, not by any means. You can't have the promised Holy Spirit without the cross, without the resurrection, without salvation. You've got to be saved first. It says so in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. So it is important when well, we know it's important to get eternal life. The whole purpose of, of salvation is to give us eternal life. We need eternal life. Uh, and reconciliation to God, justification before God, uh, a holiness of, of life. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. We've got to live holy lives. Uh, and holy lives means we're separated and consecrated to God. And that doesn't mean that we live perfect lives, <laughs> but it means we live holy lives. And by and large, Christians live holy lives, but, but nowadays, with the emphasis on technology, and everything that's going on with it, there's not that emphasis on holiness. I never hear an emphasis on holy, holy living in the church. I haven't heard it for 50, 60 years. 50 years, 55, yeah, no, 60 years. I haven't heard it in the church in Australia. I haven't heard an emphasis on holiness. Have you? You might have. I mean, some people might have. Australia have you? Well, there you are, you see? England, yeah, in England you would have. You would have heard it at those things you used to go to. What do you call them? Did you used to go to those conferences? Keswick. Eh? Keswick. Yeah, Keswick. Oh, yeah, that was based on sanctification. You see, I hope you don't mind my saying, but they do get it wrong. And, you know, I had this question from India. What about sanctification? Yes. But you see, they get it wrong, totally wrong, uh, not totally that you have to live a holy life. And mind you, they probably ha lived a more holy life than a lot of other Christians, you know. The more truth we have, the better our living before God or experience before God, the more truth we have, even if it's not perfect. You know, Jesus said, to him who has shall be given. So we all get something, then we get more. You know, you can't nullify what God has done in the lives of believers. You can't nullify the gospel and the preaching of the gospel. You can't nullify the fact that millions have found Christ. Uh, they'll be in heaven. But nevertheless, there's this wisdom of God that reveals to us more and more that we should be more and more partici participants in the grace of God that he has brought to us through Jesus Christ by giving of certain aspects of salvation. And finishing Romans chapter 4, it says, uh, in order that the promise may rest on grace. Now the, the promise, of course, the fact that the promise is the Holy Spirit, you can't have the Holy Spirit unless there's justification. And the blessing is the blessing of salvation. By your seed shall all the nations of the world, earth be blessed. They're blessed specifically by his being given in salvation. That's the blessing. We're not, we're not disregarding that whatsoever. But along with that, we need to take into account the fact that the promise, the great promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit, and you can't have the great promise of the Father without you got to have salvation. And we have salvation because we have faith like Abraham and we believe in God for salvation. See, we don't believe in God for the, for the Holy Spirit. We believe in God for Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. I think we should stick to what the Bible says. And then even if we don't fully understand it, we can't go wrong if we stick to what the Bible says. And then in verse 17, God says, Abraham, I've made you the father of many nations. In other words, he said in, in uh, chapter 12 of Genesis, in you, in your seed, 
So, if it's his seed, he's the father. But God is saying, told him that, were, that he was going to be the father of many nations. Now, that's not naturally, because he wasn't the father of many nations. He was the father of the Jews and that God made. God didn't make him the father of the Arabs or whoever they are who descend from Esau. Uh, not Esau. Ishmael. Uh, Ishmael. Why is that Esau? It mentions in Isaiah the sons of Esau, the sons of Kedah, who are the sons of Esau. Uh, and some people think that that's a lot of Muslims going to be saved, but I, d I don't think so. Well, anyway, the sons of Ishmael, they were not given by God in the sense that he gave uh, the descendants of Isaac. Totally different. So he's talking about people who get born again. He's talking about those, he's the Gentiles. And he's, this is uh, in the presence of God in whom he believed who gives life to the dead and, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Uh, I, I, I would like to look that up in the original because it puts a comma here and, and the who goes back to God. But I'm just what yeah, it, it relates to Abraham's belief because it says, in the presence of the God in whom he believed. What kind of a God did he believe in? The God who gives life to dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. That's the God he believed in. And next week, if we get around to it, we're going to see that love to God depends in a major way on our knowledge of God as revealed in the Bible, not in our perceptions and not in our imagination. And then we love God. But that's another thing. And I'd like to leave you with this. Uh, it says in Jude 20 and 21, build yourself up in your most holy faith. That includes the whole body of belief we're to build ourselves up in that. We do it. The building goes on because we're involved with the holy faith, which we're reading and absorbing. But the building goes on by praying in the Holy Ghost. It says so. And any commentator, a good commentator, who doesn't even believe in speaking in tongues will say that. Well, we know that it is in speaking in tongues. And then it goes on to say, uh, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourself in the love of God. There are three things. We build ourselves up in our most holy faith. We do that by absorbing it. Then we extend it by praying in other tongues. And when we do those things, praying in other tongues, we get a view and a vision of the love of God and we love God. That's how we love God. It's not just by singing I love you or the rest of it. It's by that. I, that's the first time I ever saw that. 